Aotearoa, this is the Taxpayers Union 2023 election debate series coming live from the palatial Homestead Sports Bar in Kerikeri in the mighty Northland. Yeah. Hosted by the Working Group, New Zealand's best weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. I am your host for this evening, editor of the daily blog, Martin Bradbury, and joining me tonight is my podcast permanent panellist, the 132nd most important libertarian columnist at Stuff, Damien Grant. No one cares. We are streaming live tonight on the Daily Blog, the Taxpayers Union, Facebook, YouTube and simulcast on Juice TV, Freeview 200. Brothers and sisters, fellow New Zealanders, comrades and citizens, thank you for tuning in to this most important of civic duties, which is to vote. In an age of disinformation, misinformation and apathy, our democracy needs engaged citizens like never before. Let's ensure that tonight we are passionate in our debate and righteous in our argument because there are only 100 democracies on earth and we are blessed to be one of them. Tonight we will debate the ideas while respecting the individual because no matter how you vote, we are all citizens and we all shake hands after the arguing. So before we begin, a toast fellow citizens to our democracy and long may we debate it to democracy! Right, let's get into the buggers. Tonight we will probe each candidate on issues that are confronting this electorate and the nation. We aren't just interested in their promises to Northland, we are interested in how they will provide leadership on the big issues confronting New Zealand right now from the poll. Issue one. Roads versus climate change versus decades of underinvestment. Issue two, hospital and health underinvestment. Issue three, crime and public safety. At the end of the debate, I will ask where we are going as a country, and each candidate will get 60 seconds to answer where they think the country is going and how voting for them and their party will impact that direction. I have to warn all five candidates now that I have an allergic reaction to party spin lines and if I hear vacant answers to important questions, I shall not hesitate in being sarcastic. <laughs> you won't like me when I'm sarcastic. After I have quizzed you on each of these topics, Damien will challenge your answers and you will get a 30 second rebuttal to him. The reason you have 30 seconds to rebut Damien is because no one should ever have to answer a libertarian for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> Before we introduce our candidates, and invite them to give up their opening statements. I'd like to invite Callum Purves from the Taxpayers Union to come to the stage and present us with the courier polling for Northland. Thank you, Martin, and good evening. Despite being a national, uh, traditional national stronghold, Northland has had its fair share of MPs in the past few elections. Like Islam a couple of weeks ago, Northland is another seat that succumbed to the red tide across New Zealand at the 2020 election when it elected Labour MP for the first time in the seat's history in the form of Willow Jean Prime, who had previously been elected on the list. Earlier this year, she was appointed as Minister for Conservation and Minister for Youth. Prior to Willow Jean's victory, the Northland electorate had almost exclusively been held by the National Party, with the notable exception of being held between 2015 and 2017 by the New Zealand First Party leader, Winston Peters, who won the seat in a yeah. by-election. Yeah. We've not even started the debate yet. <laughs> Winston Peters failed to hold on to the seat in 2017 when it was retaken for national by Matt King. Before he, there's something for everyone here, before he lost it to Labour in 2020. Matt King is standing again in this year's election for the Democracy NZ party that was founded last year. First time candidate Grant McCallum is seeking to take back the seat for National. This is going to take a long time <laughs> for National this time, while the former MP for both uh, New Zealand First and Labour parties, Shane Jones, is looking to repeat Winston Peters' success and win the seat for New Zealand First. And completing our set of candidates, um, we have 
for our ACT current list MP, Mark Cameron, and the new candidate, Raina Penny, for the Greens. So let's see how things are shaking up with our Northland electorate poll. So this was conducted on Sunday the 10th of September 2023 from a random sample of 5,000 phone numbers in the Northland electorate. 400 respondents agreed to respond and the poll complies with the code of practice uh, from the New Zealand Research Association. So moving into it, first we'll look at country direction. Country direction is a very good measure of how people are feeling as we head into the election, with a positive net direction being good for incumbent governments and a negative one tending to favour oppositions. So we have wrong, the wrong direction, 74%, right, 18%, and unsure, 8%. And that gives us a net country direction of minus 56% which is significantly worse than the national position. Um, so across the country, the recent Taxpayers Union Courier poll showed that there was a net country direction of minus 36%, so this is 20 points worse here in Northland for country direction. Moving on to the most important local issue, we asked people thinking ahead to the election which was the most important issue to them. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, certainly um, as we made our way here, uh, roading was the top issue on 36% uh, of respondents, followed by the cost of living on 15, health on 14, law and order on 8, housing on 7, co-governance on 6%, others on 5, economy on 4, 2% were unsure, local council was 1, jobs was 1, and public transport was won. So by far and away, roading was the top issue. Now moving on to party vote. If we look at all voters first, um, how they told us they were going to vote, 45% said they were voting for national. 17% for Labour. 12% for ACT. New Zealand First on 3%. The Greens also on 3%. Te Party Māori on 2%, others on 1%, and 15% were undecided, 1% refused. So if we take out the decided and the refused, we get um, a more accurate picture of what we're likely to see come the election, and that is national on 53%, which is up 26 points on the last election, Labour on 21, down 23 points, Act on 15, up 5 points, New Zealand First on 4, down 2 points, Greens on four, also down two points. Te Party Māori on two percent, also up two points, and others on two percent, which represents a swing from Labour to National of 25 points. And then, if we look at if we look at the party vote uh, split down by how well parties are retaining their 2020 party voters, let's wait for the slide to move on. Can we get a Kiwi to talk to us? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. We better than that. So, National has the best voter retention rate, um, followed by Labour, um, who are doing much worse, with only two in five 2020 voters still committed to voting for the party. Uh, one in four are now saying they're voting for National, although 18% do remain undecided. Um, the green sample is too small to, to pay attention to, and ACT party voters are split between ACT and National. We also asked name recognition for the incumbent MP <coughs> and the candidates for uh, Northland. Just wait until we move on. So for an incumbent MP, we'd usually expect a name recognition of between 50 and 70% to be considered a good score. Willow Jean Prime was a little bit below that on 45%. Despite being a good, uh, a, sorry, a good, <laughs> first, a first time candidate, Grant McCallum's name recognition is almost as good at 42%. Mark Cameron was on 11%. Shane Jones, um, also doing very well alongside Willow Jean Prime and Grant McCallum, was on 44%. Matt King has a reasonable name recognition for a minor party candidate on 31%, uh, although perhaps unsurprising given he was the previous MP. Now in seats where we have an incumbent MP, we asked how people would rate their local MP's performance in the last year. So we had 31% said very poor, 20% said poor, 22% said average, 
7% said good, 8% said very good, and 13% were unsure. So if we add up the poor and very poor and take it from the good and very good, we get a net MP rating of minus 36%. Now, if we move on to the main event, which is the electorate vote and the contest that we're witnessing being played out tonight. If we start with all voters, Grant McCallum for National is on 43%. Willow Jean Prime for Labour is on 18%. Shane Jones for New Zealand First on 13%. Matt King for Democracy New Zealand on 4%. Raina Penny also on 4%. Mark Cameron for ACT on 2%. Um, Te Party Māori, despite not having a candidate, registered 2% as well. <laughs> Others on 2%. 11% were undecided and 1% were refused. And again, if we remove the uh, undecided and the refused to see where we stand, Grant McCallum for National is um, quite far in the lead on 49%. <laughs> which is up 11 points on 2020. Willow Jean Prime for Labour on 20%, which is down 18 points. Shane Jones for New Zealand First on 15%, which is up four points. Matt King for Democracy NZ on 5%, uh, new entry this time. Raina Penny for the Greens also on 5%, which is up one point. Mark Cameron for ACT on 3%, no change from last time. And Te Pāti Māori on 2%, with others on 2 So that's a swing, again, of 25 points from Labour to National. And if we quickly look at the voter retention... Again, national voter retention is the best. Uh, similarly to uh, the previous party vote result, Willow Jean Prime is struggling to hold on to her support from last time, retaining just two in five voters from 2020. 22% of 2020 voters now plan to vote for national, while 11% are supporting New Zealand first, and 15% remain undecided, and the Act and Green samples here are too small, so I wouldn't read anything into that. The full results, if you want to go through them in more detail, then they are available on our Taxpayers' Union website. Um, that's the current state of play here in Northland with Grant McCullum leading, and I'll hand back to Martin. Thank you. Northland is so blue it may as well be a smurf. Let us begin tonight's debate by introducing our invited candidates to this evening's live stream simulcast TV debate from the New Zealand First Party, the mighty Shane Jones. Yeah. From the National Party, Grant McCullum. Yeah. From the Labour Party, Willow Jean Prime. Yeah. From the ACT Party, Mark Cameron. That's right. And from the New Zealand, from the Democracy New Zealand Party, Matt King. Yeah. Welcome to you all. Let's begin tonight with an opening one minute from each of you on your vision for Northland and New Zealand. Shane Jones, your one minute vision for Northland and New Zealand starts now. Kia ora folks, thanks for turning out. I'm standing again for New Zealand first because no other politician or political party over a three year period delivered something akin to $680 million to address the deficits in Northland. Yeah. However, the work has to continue. We've suffered a long period of time of sending people away out of the North and they disappear. They may be lions at home, but they're lambs in Parliament. The key issues that I've been fighting on is obviously my record of delivery, my also laser-like focus on infrastructure deficit, yeah. law and order. In fact, right here in Kitty Kitty, watch TikTok, more is coming. <laughs> and the other key point, quite frankly, is the quality of our services. We're only 3% of New Zealand's population. Our land mass is about 3.5%. Unless you send a politician with a proven track record of delivery, we stand and make find ourselves facing the risk of being marginalised yet again. Vote for, vote for both a party and an individual who has shown beyond size the delivery equates to the quality of the rhetoric and the volume of the sound. Shane Jones. Thank you very much, Shane. Grant, your one minute starts now. Yeah, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here, and thanks to everyone who's come out and support. Really appreciate it. It's great to see everyone partaking in democracy. Look, 
uh, National's very focused on the cost of living. I think well, today we've seen Prefu come out and we've seen the impacts that, that we've had with our, our, our economic challenges we have in New Zealand right now. Interest rates are high, inflation is high. People are struggling to, to uh, buy the groceries and pay their rent and pay their mortgages. National has a plan to deal with that and we're very focused on that. And we're looking to also, as part of that plan, we're going to uh, have a laser-like focus on reducing spending and also deliver tax cuts to middle New Zealand because they desperately need it. That squeeze middle are really suffering. So, and the other big issue for Northland that I'm very passionate about is our roads. You only had to look at the pole up there, said it all really. I get it everywhere I go. I've driven 27,000 k's around this place and I reckon I've just about to name all the potholes. And, there's, and it's a real challenge for us. A four lane uh, road all the way from, the, from uh, Walkworth right the way through to north of Whangarei, that's what's going to deliver for Northland. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jean Prime, your one-minute vision for Northland and New Zealand, please. Kia ora koutou. As you all know, I love Northland. This is home for my family. I was born and raised here. I have been, uh, I have had the honour and privilege of being an MP for the last six years. In that time, I am proud of what Labour has delivered. When I came into this position, when I came into the position of being MP for Northland, we literally had sewage running down the walls in our hospital. We have invested over $900 million into our health infrastructure in Northland, from a new hospital in Whangarei to two upgrades at the Bay of Islands Hospital, including a $10 million investment into Kaitaia Hospital. That infrastructure was so desperately needed. We need to maintain the progress that we are making, the investment into our schools, record investment into our road, but I acknowledge it's the number one issue. We have a challenge with our roading resilience and our infrastructure. We have put more money into our our roads than ever before, but we still have a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Willow Jean. Mark Cameron, your one minute vision for Northland and New Zealand, please. Yeah, thanks very much. That was comedic, wasn't it? Really, um, $50 billion extra this lot have spent in a year on the back of a hundred, oh, gracious me, $137 billion totally. Uh, when you're trying to reconcile the amount of money that this government on the left has spent. Try and reconcile 28 billion in health, waiting patient list lines have grown massively. A billion dollar whole deficit in the spending of infrastructure. There's a genuine article that in every public media, every public outfit that you read that has said we have blown this fiscal budget this year and in others. I maintain there's a better way forward. Cost benefit analysis, what does that actually look like? How is it that truancy is through the roof <coughs> when we've seen now 28% of Northland kids going to school on a regular basis. 10, $20 billion, when will it end? Let's actually have full disclosure with what we're spending here in New Zealand. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be here. I see very many familiar faces. Um, I want to be your, your MP for Northland. I was your MP for a term. It was the proudest moment. I see a lot of things that we need in Northland. Obviously, roading's a big deal. But for me, we've formed the basis of our party on freedom to choose and freedom and rights and our basic human rights, the Bill of Rights. We also are pushing back on for farmers because we don't believe that climate change catastrophe narrative that this government and even national seem to be going along with, so we're going to fight back. But for me, um, for me, it's about family, it's about freedom, it's about farming. Our poll, we did a poll with the same company a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, and we were 13% behind um, Grant as the leader. We were 13% behind, so I can't understand why with, with that poll result. We are right in the race, and I say to you this, you can party vote the party you want, because I want to change a government. Uh, this, is the, this is my goal as well, get a change of government with the worst government we've ever had. But you party vote for the party you want. There is no downside to giving me the candidate vote. I will be your MP and I'll work proudly for you. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Let's start with issue one, roads versus climate change versus decades of underinvestment. Northland has appalling infrastructure and has legacy underinvestment on top of climate change events that damage the limited infrastructure we do have. 
How does Northland get proper infrastructure investment and what does it need to do to adapt to our new climate change future? Shane Jones, New Zealand First, you got a minute. New Zealand First Provincial Growth Fund actually got things done in Northland, yeah. but getting yeah. money, yeah. it did. It did, yeah. yeah. But getting money out of Wellington, even when it has been budgeted for, is hard. How do you get Wellington to care about Northland? Your time starts now. The thing I'd remind everyone about climate change is we've got to overcome the alarmism. Climate alarmism is defeating rational cost bed of analysis, which is absolutely essential to ensure our economy is not disemboweled as we sit here fretting about temperatures overseas whilst not caring for the rules and regulations that will enable New Zealand to pay its way. The great challenge of any politician is to get the dough from Treasury into the community. Look at the politician, despite COVID, who delivered the projects largely endorsed by Northland leaders, whether it's water storage, the roundabout up the road, the upgrade of the Kedi Kedi Airport, to name but a few, projects that have languished during the 30 or 40 years. And who held the seat during that period? Grant's party. <laughs> Damien Grant, your follow-up question based on Shane's answer, please. Did you support the, uh, the roads of national significance? We support projects of national significance, <laughs> including rail and coastal shipping. We want a road in three years over the Bryn Derwins, not a pipe dream. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> because, because my question is that prior to the change of government, um, Stephen Joyce was a magnificent road builder, whatever else you say about him. And after the change of government, that road building, including the road up here, was stopped. Was it a mistake to um, be involved in a government that killed the roads of national significance? In terms of Northland, substantial amounts of money continued to flow into roads through the Provincial Growth Fund. Just ask the Kuiper Mayor here. And also the restoration of rail services. Stephen Joyce was demonstrably a champion for roads of national significance, but the promises to go north of Walkworth were made without a single dollar having been allocated in the budget to meet the costs of those long-winded statements that Stephen made on a regular basis. Thank you, Shane. Uh, Grant, 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 charming. Grant, Chris Luxon has promised to slash 14,000 backroom bureaucratics, but analysis of the cut shows 31% needing to come out of areas like regional civil defence comms. The extreme climate change events we are witnessing in Northland have sharply highlighted the need for that regional civil defence. Are you, as a local, concerned that your own party's slash and burn promises won't see regional civil defence in Northland threatened? Your time starts now. Actually, the civil defence, of course, the frontline services are, of course, going to be funded. We've made it quite clear it's about the back room, not the front The room, comms. The right? comms department. No. <laughs> So, but actually, I just want to take issue with the road, the roading statements coming from the people sitting next to me. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Like, everyone kind of forgets that, yes, National had a vision and a plan to build roads to Whangarei, four lanes. And we actually, and the funding, you, and people say there was no money. Well, actually, the proof is in the pudding. We funded the road that is now, that we all love, enjoy driving on, which goes from Puhoi to Walkworth. And that's, that is proof in the pudding. We, have, we know how to build roads. We always have and we always will. You can trust National on Roads. Thank you. Damien Grant, your question? The question was about the 14,000 additional, <laughs> <coughs> additional public servants, which by and large, I suspect, uh, you go to Wellington, you see them, the, the, the lanyard cars, they're not doing anything. How serious, how committed, how much confidence can we have that you and Chris Luxon will actually fire those 14,000 individuals. I want to see their names. <laughs> have you got a good lawyer? <laughs> You'll need one if you're going to go and name them all.
Uh, look, we are very focused on reducing the backroom expenditure so that we can actually then make sure frontline services get delivered, but also save money so we can deliver to the, 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 the deliver to the New Zealanders the tax relief they need, so they can afford to be a, a, they can afford to buy their groceries, pay their bills, and pay their mortgage. Thank that wasn't a yes. But right. Thank you, Grant. Well, Eugene, Labor refused to implement a wealth tax to fund infrastructure Northland needs. How does an electorate so vulnerable to climate change adapt without extra funding to pay for that investment? Your time starts now. So in terms of the latest GPS, what our roads have been identified as one of the 14 priority roads that have been budgeted for, uh, which we um, will be delivering on. Over $300 million into the first stage of that um, particular road. On top of that, we also have budgeted for $44 million for the roads that were impacted by the cyclone. That is Cove Road, so I acknowledge the Mangafai audience that is here, Paparoa Oakley, as well as the Brindurans. We are looking at the alternative routes for the Brindurans and committing to that. We put $100 million into the Mangamukas, as well as strengthening the resilience of State Highway 10. All of these projects are are funded, currently funded, budgeted and funded. Thank you, Willow. Uh, Damien, you got a follow-up question? But it's true though, isn't it, following through, if Shane, jo if Shane Jones, if Stephen <laughs> Joyce, sorry, they're both, they're both so good looking I get confused. Um, if, if the roads of national significance had continued, they'd be here now. I mean, the, 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 four, the beautiful four-lane highway all the way up with, with Kentucky Fried Chicken and BP stations all the way up, it would be done by now, wouldn't it? Um, no. What, no, what you didn't hear before, what you Let didn't hear before was that it wasn't actually funded for. So it's great to have a vision and a plan, but it didn't have the funding. What we have is a vision, a plan, and committed funding to actually make it happen. But I'll also tell you, it's not just the four laning. You talk to somebody in the Mangamukas, you talk to somebody on State Highway 10, this is north of Whangarei, we need a resilient roading network right across Taitokero, not just State Highway 1, but we'll take that too. Thank you, thank you. Thank, oh, no, you, you, yeah, no, you got a good question for that. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Yeah, rip into them. Yep, thank you. I will. So we've had five extreme weather events since June 2022 and March 2023. The slips that we fixed in the first round, none of them failed in the second round. The extreme weather we are experiencing, the extreme weather we are experiencing means that we have to build more resilient roads. Over a hundred million dollars has been committed to bringing the Mangamukas back to its original standard. That is a significant amount of money being invested into our community. Thank you, thank you, Willow Jean. Uh, Mark Cameron. Act loves roads. I believe David Seymour would marry Tarsiel if he could. <laughs> but Act's preference is told user pays roads. Poverty is deep in Northland. User pays roads would rule a lot of people out from using them. So does Act support mass state subsidy of public transport in Northland to provide an alternative to your venal stealth privatisation of roads? No, your I'd time starts I'd, now. I'd, I'd answer that a different way. At the end of the day, a couple of things. We got a $50 billion extra amount of money that's been spent in the last five and a half, six years. Try and reconcile that if you're a Kiwi. We're in a cost of living crisis. It's all very well to talk about four, lanes, four lane highways to the top of the country. The recent iteration walk with the Puhoi is $900 million. Try and reconcile a billion dollars that hasn't been spent on road maintenance across the entire country. That's a fiscal hole, a monetary spend that never happened. What I would say, there's a genuine argument made for all of us to have toll roads. There's about four of them, as far as I'm aware, in the country, and 80% of the people that I've spoken to are using the new road, uh, road currently. Only 12 to 15% are not. I would argue there's a genuine argument to be made that tolls and private-public partnerships between government and other uh, fo foreign investment might be the way forward. Chinese, right? <laughs> not necessarily. What a terrifying future. Damien, your time starts now. How many kilometres of road can we afford with the savings we get from scrapping the Human Rights Commission? 
That's a, that's a, that, that, that's a fair... I think there's, there's more to be scrapped than just that. You could also talk about being rid of Palmu farms that are running a lot. There's a, there's a myriad right. of things. So, there's a myriad of things. But I'll, I'll answer that, Damien. Yes. I think the, mo the most important thing, to your earlier question, there's 14,000 extra bureaucrats in Wellington. Ask yourself, are kids going to school and we're spending $18 billion? $28 billion in the Ministry of Health. Are we getting better health care? I wager most New Zealanders would say not. Yes, there's a genuine argument to be made. We can. Matt King. Some would say that Democracy New Zealand is a conspiracy party, so I don't know if you believe in roads. Um, uh, I went to your website, and you don't have an infrastructure policy, but you do have a climate change policy, and you've called for us to ignore methane emissions on climate change because they only last in the atmosphere for 12 years, but methane traps 80 times more than carbon dioxide, so what's the point of building any infrastructure in Northland if your climate policy only exacerbates the extreme weather events washing those roads away? Your time starts now. Okay, so we don't subscribe to the climate change catastrophe narrative. If you look at the IPCC, which came out this year and said methane has seven times the potency of, uh, of carbon dioxide, not 28 times. 80. That, no, it's seven times rather than 28 times. There's no, there's no change in sea level. There's no increase in, no um, measurable change in temperature. We are taxing our farmers. They're the most efficient producers of food in the world. All that happens is that the production goes offshore and overall emissions goes up. That's, that's the crazy world we live in. If you follow what the Labor government want, and they use their clean car uh, tax, the clean car um, tax, what, what will happen is we'll be driving EVs and they'll be charged by Indonesian coal. That's the crazy world we live in at the moment with this current policy. <laughs> Damien Grant, you have a follow-up question to Matt King. Your supporters are very ecumenical, I have to say. They, they, they clapped everybody, and I thought that was great. They're a, a wonderful group of people. Um, a, a question. <laughs> Carbon dioxide, how many parts per million is, uh, do, do we currently have, and where does it, when does that become a problem? So it's at 400 parts per million at the moment, and uh, it's plant food. CO2 is plant food. So um, the, this current focus, and this includes the National Party, on hammering agriculture is unfair on us. We should be selling ourselves to the world as the most efficient producers of food in the world, the lowest carbon emitters in the world. That's our selling point to the rest of the world. If we want to save the planet, Tell the, country, the rest of the world to buy New Zealand produce. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to issue two. Northland's infrastructure under investment isn't just in roading, it's also in healthcare. A wide swathe of Northland have health-deprived areas with, most, with, with, with health stats that are worse than most average New Zealanders elsewhere. Northland voters said health and hospitals were one of the issues that most influenced their vote this election grant. Healthcare and the hospital infrastructure were one of the biggest concerns. National have taken Northland for granted for, granted for decades. When will National start taking Northlanders seriously? And when will they start investing into Northlanders' health? What extra health dollar investments will National will, will Northland see under a National Government? Well, actually, we've the, uh, the new hospital that's going to be built in Whangarei, National started the process of actually getting, before we, before we got booted out, started the process of actually working out what needed to be done. Then the current government, when it was uh, forecast to cost $900 million, came in and said, no, take $200 million off the table, you've only got $700 million. What that means is when it's built, the ED, uh, the ED, opera, ED part of the hospital will not operate efficiently enough to meet the targets and the, uh, 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 the targets of, of, of good throughput. And the second thing is within three years, it'll be at capacity. I'm sorry, but if you're going to invest in health infrastructure, you may as well do it properly. Damien? <laughs> what is the point of investing in health infrastructure if you don't change the underlying model, because we had nine long years of national and you didn't actually change the model. So when there was a change of administration, all we just got was the same dysfunctional model. You didn't even bring in the Crown Health Enterprises reforms that, that Jim Bolger have, and that was weak tea. So what is national going to do for the time that you are in power, if the electorate is kind enough to give you back power, what are you going to do 
to change the way that the health system is operated so when Willow Jean is re-elected into this seat, we, the system will continue to function. Well, actually, the, um, the health services in, in Northland, uh, what they're really lacking at the moment are professionals. We're lacking doctors and nurses. We're going to focus very heavily on investing on, in, in training up more doctors and nurses because that is what's going to drive better health care for Northlanders. So the same, the same broken single pale model that we have had is going to continue under well, we, national... And we're That's not okay. Gonna, we, we know that we, we know. We're not going to waste money. We're not going to waste money on and during the middle of a pandemic investing in a restructure, which all that did was create a whole lot of people in the back office and no one, not enough doctors and nurses on the front line. Willow, Willow, Jean, COVID showed us how crucial our health system is and how underfunded it has been for too many decades. In 2023, Labour poured $26.5 billion into health, yet many health statistics have gone backwards. Labour had an unprecedented MMP majority. If you can't get shit done when you have a majority and more money, why hope now for our health system? Your time starts now. So we have got done, and what we did was we reformed the health system. We had a postcode lottery of health here in Northland. We passed the pay order... Healthy Futures for All Act, so that we end the postcode lottery. Northland are benefiting from that. You are right, we have inherited a mess. We did not have the investment in our infrastructure. As I said, over $900 million, and can I say that was a commitment to stage one. We also committed to stage two. Sorry. 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 So I think, that was the, I, think, I think that was the Green Party, sorry. <laughs> Should I... Should I? Yep, I'll continue. Um, so we reformed... Sorry, we, we have a glitz in the matrix. Should I... Um, sound check? It's a little bit of a reverb. Okay. Yep. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just stay here look, looking good. Well, it's easy for Mark Cameron. The rest of us, the rest of us struggle. I think it's... Where, Yep, all good now. Yeah, okay. okay, carry on. So we have invested in the health infrastructure, as I explained earlier. We have reformed the health system. I am Associate Minister of Health, privileged to have that role. Only since February, one of my roles is the Associate Minister of Health for rural communities. We have developed the first ever rural health strategy, identifying what are the, the goals for us to achieve equitable health outcomes in our communities. We also have a workforce strategy to address the issues of workforce for shortages, not only in rural areas, but all across the country. None of that existed when we came into power. Uh, Damien, your question, your question based on Willow Jen's answer, please. Looking back at what happened during COVID and the flow-on effects that have, that, that have occurred for that, particularly in our young people, do you think that the cost that, that, we, that we incurred, particularly in the, the, the health sector and the increase in truancy, and, and I mean, let's face it, democracy in New Zealand, all came out of the government reaction to, to COVID. Did we overreact with the lockdowns? You know, this was a, if I may. It was a global pandemic, a one in 100 year event. There was no rule book, there was no playbook for this. We had to make decisions to save lives and to save livelihoods. We have had one of the best COVID responses in the world. But I, I, I acknowledge, I acknowledge, I acknowledge that there are some um, within the audience who um, dispute that. I am proud of our response. I am proud of our communities. We did save lives. I know it was hard. I know our young people in particular have a challenge around <coughs> mental health. That's what they have told me. Those are the challenges that we've now got as we recover from COVID and we look forward to our future. Mark, Mark Cameron, if... If people can't currently afford public health services, how on earth can Northlanders afford Act's privatisation of Pharmac agenda? Your time starts now. Well, I think I'd go back, actually. Can I just go back to Willow's previous remarks? 
I mean, we lived through a pandemic, right? We were told to go home, put a teddy bear in the window and dob in our neighbours. And all the while this was happening, not long thereafter, there were health reforms. So try and reconcile that with the $26, $27 billion that's being spent and outcomes. And I'm not being divergent from the question, but I think we've really got to hone in on this. How is it so that patient wait list times, operation times have blown out and we've spent all this money? We've turned around and said we'd spend $163 million, or about 13% increase on GP capitation, actually so you can go and see a doctor rather than waiting hours on end. Have an independent, fully independent contracted authority for mental health and addiction. The current government spends $2 billion, $1.9 billion on mental health and routinely, to Damien's point, actually young people that are suffering on the back of COVID, truancy, drug addiction, etc., that number has ballooned. We have... The question is, are you going to privatise Pharmac? And if not, why not? At this stage, not that I'm aware of. That's I'm the, that's the honest answer I can give you. Oh, look. <laughs> so, so, I'm, I'm what is, what is the plan? So not that I'm privy to, no. OK, very disappointing. <clears throat> Matt, um, Mr King, now... Some have said that Democracy New Zealand is a conspiracy party. And I'm just Come having on. a look at your... Come on, they're, they're, they're I'm in just the room. having a look at... I know, right to their faces. Um, and I'm just looking at your health policy. You said... And I'm just looking at this wee health policy gem here, and if I can just quote from you. Cancel agreements with the World Health Organization and unelected private entities which undermine national self-determination. Can you explain to the folks at home... Yeah, Uncle, Uncle Matt, which World Health Organisation agreements New Zealand has that Democracy New Zealand would cancel? And seeing as we're a founding member of the World Health Organisation, aren't you talking hundreds of pieces of public health legislation that we would need to cancel? Your time starts now. Um, Bomber, why do you keep mentioning the word conspiracy all the time? You're just trying well, to drive read, an agenda. Just because I read your website and it fucking looks yeah, like you're it. You're driving it really an agenda. Does. You're trying to. You're, you're doing it typically what media do. Okay. So what I say to this: What happened in the last three years with COVID happened in a whole lot of countries around the world in lockstep. The same words were used. The same um, the, the the traffic light system. The same lockdowns. The same stuff. And it was wrong, and it'll be proven to be wrong. And the World Health Organization is coming out with a, um, with a plan, uh, pandemic plan, right, in 2024 to be ratified, which will take away our country's sovereignty and rights to do what we want to do in our country. And I think that's very, very dangerous. So I say what we do as Kiwis, as our politicians, as our rulers, we do what's right for Kiwis in this country. To hell with what the overseas organisations that are run by a lot of rich people... Um, do. So that's, that's what we're about. <laughs> Damien, uh, your follow-up question I'm gonna, to that, please. I'm going to pull you up on something that, I'm pulling up something that you said. Yep. You described Martin as a member of the media. <laughs> there is no way that any self-respecting private sector or media organisation would touch Martin with a hundred, not even a road of national significance to get to him. You want to talk about a conspiracy theory fight, you go to the Daily Blog. It is full of the most way out there, crazy. The Daily Blog makes Democracy look, New Zealand look like a respectable organisation. So I am been been harangued by this crazy Marxist loon is a no Marxist way, anarchist. Marxist no anarchist. Way you can never get it right for Christ's sake. Democracy in New Zealand. If you're going to put me in a box, mate, in the right box, Damien. Oh, no, I've got exactly the box I'm going to put you in. I've got the size and it's all measured out nicely. Oh. <laughs> democracy, <laughs> democracy New Zealand does not need you to make them look like a conspiracy theory fruitcakes. All right, I forgot the question. Where are you? Hey, uh, I've got a question for you, Damien. Yes. I've got a question. What do you drink? <laughs> uh, um, you'll be very disappointed if you found out what I drink. Jones, <laughs> not to be left behind in the conspiracy stakes, you wrote a critical attack in June of this year on the World Health Organization where you played to the same scaremongering insinuations of a shadowy global conspiracy to allow global government to overtake local democracy. Is New Zealand First actually interested in discussing health or is it just fringe culture war talking points? I mean, isn't Winston currently raging about transgender bathrooms? Your time starts now. 
Our motivation is to challenge and get rid of wokemania. Yeah. We will not be committing to the brand new treaty being negotiated furtively at the WHO, WHO without the informed consent of Kiwis and their legislators. Neither do we want to see a continuation of the spread and destructive divisiveness associated with the United Declaration of Indigenous Rights signed by John Key, the ACT Party and the Māori Party. That's why our party is not going to tolerate the unmandated spread of united global perspectives thwarting local democracy. Uh, Damien? Shane? I'm, I, I'm, I, I am nervous. I am nervous about the answer that I'm likely to get. But my question to you is, what is a woman? <laughs> and I know you know the answer. Matua Shane Jones has 19 mohapunas. <laughs> he has his beautiful wife sitting right in front. Bro, that's a woman. <laughs> Let's move on to issue three and the sudden shocking spike in youth crime and organised crime. Post-COVID, media coverage of youth crime has exploded. Images of ram raids and organised crime violence has shocked, frightened and angered the country. Alongside the youth crime wave, we have organised crime turf wars as 501 syndicates stand over domestic gangs for the billion dollar meth trade. Northland voters said law and order is one of the most important local issues that would impact their votes this election. Willow Jean, we have a youth crime rate generated by post-COVID inequalities and an organised crime wave generated by the 501 syndicates attempting to take over the meth trade. We have a poorly resourced and underfunded police force, could a wealth tax help fund better policing and community safety? So since Labour came into government, we have put over 1,800 police on the beat. And Northland, and Northland has had a 21% increase in the number of police up here, as opposed to 14% when National was in government. But you are talking specifically about youth crime, and as the Minister for Youth, this is something that I am particularly concerned about, and have been working alongside other ministers, like our Minister for Police and Justice, our Minister for Children, Calvin Davis, about what we can do to support our rangatahi, because none of us want to see them on a pathway to Ngāwha. So we want to have wraparound services and interventions. You will know that we are promoting um, a change in law for RAM raids so that they can get the support and assistance that they need, the intensive interventions at an earlier age to stop them from reoffending. Nobody wants these children to live a life of crime. Now recently I visited Kaitaia, Hua Rangatahi Jim. For, for, for the noisy ones at the back, Hua Rangatahi Gym. It's a free gym for our rangatahi. Youth development coordinators are working with them. Over 800 interactions with rangatahi in their first six weeks. These positive programs that pathway them to alternative education, to training and back into school is better than having them out on the streets being Amen, prospected. Sister. Amen. Mark, thank you. Uh, Mark Cameron, ACT wants to dump the gun registry. Oh, oh shit, sorry, I just completely ignored Damien. Damien, go for it, knock yourself out. I mean, we like to say it's a working group, but it's a Martin Bradbury show, really. <laughs> Pretty much, that's what they're here for, folks. Yes. Go on, Damien. Um, in your maiden speech, you, it was a, a, a beautiful speech, and you were talking about those people, and you recognised their names, and they were, they, they, they were from... The, your community, you recognise the names. In the six years that National, so that Labor have been in power, and you have been the MP, that that those data, those statistics haven't improved. In fact, in a lot of ways, they've gotten worse. So, what are you going to do differently in the next three to six years? if Labor is re-elected, than what you've done in the past six years? Because what you're doing now isn't working. So you're right. In my maiden speech, I said how distraught I was by the fact that 
Um, those carrying names that are recognisable with whakapapa to this area are on their pathway to ngafa. That's not where they should be. And we have to do more. It's not what we just do um, in the justice space. It's the support we give whānau. It's the determinants, social determinants for health, for crime. It's poverty. It's intergenerational. It's not going to be turned around in six short years. We need long-term sustained funding into interventions into interventions for children and their whānau that are going to work. Thank you. Uh, Mark Cameron, ACT wants to dump the gun registry and repeal the ban on semi-automatic weapons and assault rifles. When in basic civil society has the answer ever been more submachine guns? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll go back to the premise, actual genuine premise of your question. The simple fact is, where gun registry and registration has actually been brought in around the world, it's failed. Classic example, Canada. When they first floated the idea, it was $2 million to actually get a registry for firearms. Um, it cost $2 billion. Now, by virtue of data capture, if it doesn't capture 90% of all firearms, 10% go un un unfound, and by virtue... The, the registry is considered a failure, so that cost him $2 billion. We have proposed, or the current government has proposed, spending over $200 million for our registry. That will invariably balloon out. Now, 40%, roughly, of the guns that are thus far being recovered by police, having the serial numbers ground off. 250,000 licensed firearm holders instantly became the enemy of the state, sadly, by this government, after our nation's tragedy in March 15th. If we're going to have a registry, it's got to work. And as proposed, it wouldn't. It doesn't actually capture the legitimate... It captures only the legitimate people. Damien, your question. The culture in New Zealand, when it comes to guns, is very different from what we have um, with our friends in the United States. The registration and control of guns has a fairly high degree of community support. And particularly when you look at the events of, of, of March 15th, it's not an unreasonable reaction, isn't it, to an event like that for the state, and this is an area where the state has, has wide community buy-in, to actually try and get some handle on those semi-automatic -auto weapons. Look, I'm a great civil libertarian, I'm a great libertarian, but the idea of somebody walking down the street with an AK-47, who probably should be in prison, concerns me. It's a, that's a realistic response, isn't it? A fairly fair, fair response, but the simple fact is it's not going to capture the people that aren't, aren't licensed firearm holders, and I, I reiterate the point. 40% of the firearms that have been caught um, by the police have had the serial numbers ground off. So whilst I appreciate this offends a lot of people here, the simple reality is if you don't get 90% prescription from New Zealanders, it's foiled. It doesn't work. And I think the wider point is we've had registry for the likes of pistols since the 1920s. The collectors have licences that they and registration they have to adhere to. Um, gracious me, dealers have registrations. So, again, they're captured. Uh, Matt King. Now, some have said Democracy in New Zealand is a conspiracy party. <laughs> they have. You're a comedian. I man. have you repeatedly. You are a comedian. Now, but, but, but... But you're less conspiracy theory on guns than ACT. You say you will review the firearms registry. You won't cut it like ACT. How dangerous do you think ACT's spineless acquiescence to the gun lobby is? And will it create safer communities or more dangerous communities? Okay, so I was a copper for 14 years. And um, last time I looked, every criminal I know didn't refer to the Arms Act before they took their gun out and went and did their crime. So it doesn't stop a damn thing. All it's done is target um, law-abiding gun owners. And it was a knee-jerk reaction to what happened in Christchurch. And I was in the caucus when they came up with that law and no one wanted to speak against it. I said, I'm a law-abiding gun owner and this legislation you're putting through, you're not listening to anyone and you're not creating good law. So us at, at uh, Democracy NZ, we're given the privilege to be in there and hold the balance of power, keep bloody on, um, national honest and act. We will say re repeal that whole a bit of legislation and create, using all the submissions, 20,000 submissions, create some good law that is fair for law-abiding gun owners and still makes it a lot harder for the criminals. Thank you, Tim. I just, I just want to pull you up on something. You described Martin as a comedian. 
comedians are funny. <laughs> great joke, Damien. Great, great joke. Thank you. Said, Thank you, Damien. Said, I was. I never said I was a comedian. There's um, a question here somewhere, isn't there? No, though? actually, there's not. Um, okay. Guns, guns, guns bore me. Honestly, could I get a gun license under your regime? I'd like a gun license. Why could I shit up? Look. <laughs> Hey, look, well, I'm responsible. You if, can trust if, me. If they had followed the procedure that was in place for the Christchurch sh shooter, he would not have got those guns. If they'd done it properly and followed the procedure with proper background checks, he would not have got those guns. Absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Shane Jones, Winston wants to use the Terrorism Suppression Act to designate gangs domestic terrorists so that paramilitary force can be authorised. <laughs> to be a stickler for civil liberties, but won't that start a radicalisation process that leads to a far more dangerous police state outcome? Thoughts? The gangs answer to no one but themselves. Even in our pleasant little town of Kirikiri, located are gangs that we don't know about, the police know about, and I don't know why the hell they haven't driven them out of town. Yeah. In order for New Zealand to push back against the spread of 501 organised crime, we're going to have to bring the hammer down. What is the point of defending your liberties if you've got a small group, well-armed, thuggish, highly intimidatory, capable of killing people, believing they can wander around with impunity? Sorry, we need the strong arm of the law to drive those roosters out of town. Damien? We did drive them out of town from Auckland and that's how they ended up here. Um, but, but Shane, why, why are the gangs so powerful? What is giving them their revenue? What is giving them the ability to, to do what they do with such impunity? Look, I'm being encouraged to say it was Jacinda. Yeah. No, but that's, that's not, not true. Going. It was John Key's government who changed the law enabling judges to let criminals off and not face the full consequences of their actions. Yeah. Don't blame Labour for that. It was John Key and Bill English. Secondly, the gangs are possessed of a feral culture and they're going to start to use arguments about colonisation to embed their authority in our community. I have zero confidence that National will take the talkie or the axe to the gangs. I have zero confidence that the Stinky Pinky Bus Act will actually see through their promises against crime. Winston and I will, because most of those people are our people. Grant, if people don't feel safe in their communities, those communities wither and die, but you can't arrest your way out of crime. We all know that get tough on crime plays well, but beyond the lock them up and throw away the keys model, what do you think has to actually happen to make Northland safer? Well, we not, the first thing we're not going to do is have a target to reduce, the, the only target the Labor actually had was to reduce crime by 30%. We're not going to do that. Uh, in terms of actually make people safer, and I've been travelling around Northland quite a bit and visit with the Kaihu community, where they had the, the local garage was robbed twice in the space of three weeks. And there was 80 people turned up in, a, in the little town, little hall there in, at the rugby club. And they were worried, and people not feeling safe. We have a plan to deal with that, and a lot of that is focused around the gangs. And, and with Mark Mitchell as our, our, potentially as our minister, I have a lot of faith in Mark, former policeman. He was a decorated policeman, and he, know, he will not be taking a backward step when dealing with the gangs. So, yes, we will actually do something about and hold them to account for their actions. You close the police stations down. No, we did not close. They, they, those are an operational decision, not a, not a ministerial decision. Uh, Damien. All right. The, you've, you've got a reasonably similar policy prescription from Shane Jones in New Zealand First and ACT, which is just to get out the jackboot and start arresting people left, right and centre. Those of us who care about civil liberties, and I realise this, you know, I mean, I keep finding it's myself... two one person. ...democracy in New Zealand. Those of us who believe in, 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 in civil or, or uncivil liberties find this approach deeply disturbing. And if you have a look at National's policy, you have a lot of stuff that, that devolves to the police 
powers that should sit with the judiciary. Are you concerned that you are giving to the state power that should be sitting with the, with the judiciary? Aren't we going a step too far with some of your policies? No, I believe we're not doing that at all. For example, the, one of the things that uh, people... So we have a, a gang register, right? So we know which, who people... And they're well listed as who the, those, they, those groups are. And to be actually put onto that register, you actually have to uh, get the minister signs it off. So, and then that, the minister is answerable to the people of New Zealand on that, right? So don't worry, Damien. If, if the libertarian group of, 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 of Damien Grant gets, comes up, I don't think it'll get registered. Hold on, hold on. I would, I would. So you are saying, you you are saying there is going to be a list of deplorables that the minister gets to decide who's on the list and who's not on the list. There is currently a gang register, if you didn't know. I did did not know that, and I am outraged about that. And I want to know, and I'll ask my... You want to know why you're not on it? Um, Oh, don't worry, I'm on the state's deplorable list. (laughs) Uh, Just so we've got it straight, um, now... Labor want to put ankle bracelets on 12-year-olds. ACT, you want to put ankle bracelets on 11-year-olds. National, you want to put them on 10-year-olds. Can we get any better offers from Shane and Matt? Fetuses, how long can we go? What are we looking at here? Shane. Caregivers and parents who do not take responsibility for the actions of their children should be put on that bloody bracelet as well. Uh, Damien, you have some personal questions for uh, ACT Party candidate Mark Cameron. Um, uh, goodness, we, um, um, we, uh, we jump through. Um, Mark, you spent 30 years on the farm. Yes. 30 years. Why, for the love of all that is good and sane, <laughs> would you leave... This is, a, this is a career where you're actually doing things. You are contributing to the country. Yeah. Why did you throw that away to go into the, the morbid cesspit of politics. I mean, look, look around you. These are... <laughs> <laughs> I pretty, mean, you're, you're, pretty, sharing pretty a stage, right? you're sharing a stage with me and Martin, which is bad enough, and we're probably the best ones here. Why? Oh, look, the Zero Carbon Act was being passed, and I was affronted by it. I'm a Kiwi farmer. I'm like Matt. I celebrate rural New Zealand every day. We're the most efficient farmers in the world, and we were, <laughs> and we were going... And we were going to be marginalised outside of that, outside, um, by virtue of it. And I said, look, I can go home and yell at the sky in consternation or I can stick my hand up and try and fix this bloody nonsense. So, yeah, I stood for What us. do you miss about farming? Uh, the, the, um, well, being told off, the muck and the mire, uh, the cow shed, you name it all. Hey, look, I, I love farming, uh, but that's why I go and represent rural New Zealand in Parliament. Pretty much the only active farmer in the building currently. Damien, you have a personal question for Matt King. <clears throat> you... Do not use the C word. You can do it. Right? Um, I want to know about the trip around the United States in a Ford station wagon in the US, Canada and Mexico. Please tell me you did something that you're not prepared to share with us. <laughs> That's a yes. Wife's right there. No, no, no. I, I, um, that, was, that was a great memory of mine, and I recommend everyone to go and do the big OE. I, I had 12 months sleeping in the back of a station wagon, working around the place a little bit, meeting beautiful um, uh, US... Beautiful. <laughs> I met my wife when I got back. Um, I... I had a, the time of my life, I can tell you that, and the, the experiences I had I'll take to the grave. And I, um, I was... The, the, uh, the Americans... <laughs> this and might the, be quite soon. The Americans and the Canadians that I, um, rat, I made some great friends and I had a great time and I do recommend it. And I don't really have anything that, I, that I'm ashamed of that I did. I did get pulled over by the police twice. As soon as they heard my accent, they treated me like a king. Are you allowed to go back to the United States? I absolutely can, Yes. Why have you heard something? <laughs> Just Damien, you have a personal question for Shane Jones. Shane, do you do you remember when we first met? <laughs> oh, oh, I would not answer this. <laughs> this could be evidence. <laughs> Bro, I know what a woman is, okay? <laughs> do you do you remember? 
Uh, no, I don't recall when we first met. Shit. Uh, that's a uh, that's a shame. I um I I I have a I have a picture of it. I'll. Uh... <laughs> do you do you remember? So just just so we're clear, it is it's it's, it's a picture I took of Shane Jones and Winston Peters, whilst you, sir, were still a member of the Labour Party. <laughs> yep, keep going. They were, keep going. <laughs> they were they were in the corporate box of Sky Television, right next to right next to mine. And so you sat next to me, and there were the Warriors out there playing, and I was sitting next to you on the other side. And do you remember what you were doing? Um, given that the Warriors have broken my heart for the last fifteen fucking years, I don't really remember. <laughs> You, sir, were reading the paper <laughs> while the warriors were out there toiling away. That's so, probably because, if not Helen Clark, someone would have said to me, oh no, another Mountfarth from Shane in the paper. <laughs> and that would never have been true, so I was checking the inaccuracy of that <laughs> allegation. Are, we, are the warriors going to win the grand final this year, Shane? That is my nephew, Stacey Jones, so up the waz, we'll follow them to the bitter end, but please can someone put an injection of positive, adaptable play on the All Blacks so that we bring home the cup, as you'll demonstrate Winston and I will do. Thank you very much. Damien, you have a personal question for Grant McCullum. <sighs> Grant, you have been... You got a heads up on this question, so you know where I'm going. Yes, I do. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you've already been mentioned in Parliament once before, and it was a lovely tribute. Do you want to do you want to remind people, uh, Matt, what you said about Grant in your maiden speech? I have no, I can't remember. No, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> you praised him for his work in getting you elected, and for his wisdom. And, and, you, and you said that in your maiden speech. Now, my question to you, Grant, is given, do you stand by your decisions back then yes. to put Mr King in Parliament? And if you don't, has your judgment improved, sir? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, I suppose life has, does move in mysterious ways, it would be fair to say. Uh, yep, I think that would have to be one of my biggest, achieve, most challenging achievements was to get Matt over the line, it would be fair to say. Uh, he, did, he did work very hard, but um, Matt had a, uh, he had a uh, propensity to put up some interesting um, social media posts. And one or two of us had to keep telling them to take them down. <laughs> but no, look, you know, look, that was, that was part of the job. I've, I've been a member of the National Party for a very long time. And I've chaired campaigns up here for, with John Carter. We've managed to beat this man a few times. Just a few times, wasn't it, Shane? Uh, and then we've also, when, when, when Matt came along, I chaired um, uh, Mike Saban's campaigns. We won those. We also then, and then Matt came along, and we, and we managed to get Matt to beat Winston Peters. And I reckon, I reckon that would have to be one of the most amazing achievements in politics for a whole bunch of reasons. So, and a great work from, you know, and so, yeah, so do I regret it? No, I was just doing my job as a good, loyal person in the National Party. Thank you. So, are you going to return, if, if the good people of this electorate are generous enough to put you into office, are you going to return the favour and, and, and mention the excellent work that Matt King has done in his time up here? Well, let's all get ahead of ourselves. Let's just wait and see. <laughs> one step at a time. Thank you. Or one vote at a time, more to the point. Thank you, Dave. Damien, you have a personal question for Willow Jean? I don't know this whole personal thing. It kind of just, maybe just, we'll just we should just call them questions. Um, uh, Willow Jean, you, um, I, I liked your maiden speech. I, uh, uh, you, you quote uh, Dame Fina Cooper, uh, and I'll read the quote. Take care of our children. Take care of what they hear. Take care of what they see. Take care of what they feel. For how the children grow, so, so will be the shape of Aotearoa. It's been six years... How do you feel that in, in, your, in your time 
And I realise a lot of things happen in politics. You've been, been a backbencher. You don't necessarily have the ability to, to change what is happening around you. But how do you feel in your six years you've been able to, to live up to those am ambitions that you outlined back then? So one of the other things I said in my maiden speech was that not one more child should live in poverty. And I am proud that through the things that the Labour government have done, we have lifted over 77,000 children out of poverty. But as I said in my earlier answers, they're the facts. As I said in my earlier answers, we are dealing with decades of underinvestment, intergenerational challenges. It cannot be simply turned around in six years. But there are many, many initiatives that give me great hope for our children and for our rangatahi that it is going to change the shape of Aotearoa. One in particular that I am so proud of is our Lunches in Schools programme. Our tamariki up here... Our tamariki up here are getting full pukus and they are learning at school. Education is a pathway to a better future, not only for the children, but for their families as well. I will say, I will say, Willow Jean, given the behaviour of the crowd here tonight, I think you are doing an exceptional job. We now have 60 seconds from Democracy New Zealand candidate Matt King. We have got a terrible cost of living crisis. What do we need to do about it? Your time starts now. Okay, for a start, we need a government that actually has fiscal responsibility. Uh, $50 million on a feasibility study about a bike ramp over the Harbour Bridge. $500 million uh, to store rat to expiring rat tests. This is just... The secret to good governance is just not doing the dumb stuff. And in my view, this government is the worst and the dumbest that we've ever had. I think, I think that the country is going to change governments this, this, this election, I think we have to, for the good of the country. And I want to be part of that, and I, I, I ask that you consider me, candidate vote for me, get me in there, because I will be your hardest working MP. You can have a guy that's the leader of a party that's not a muzzled backbench MP, because you are muzzled when you're in a big party. I'll be able to be outspoken for you, and I'll be able to represent you in Wellington. <coughs> Shane Jones, 60 seconds, cost of living crisis, what do we need to do? The cost of living crisis is driven by the cost of energy and the energy sector put together by Max Bradford, that great high priest of the National Party, has left us with a ruthlessly expensive cost of living energy driven crisis. Secondly, I started in 2013 the crusade against countdown and the supermarkets. It's taken nine years for Labour to finally do something about it. And in that duopoly, monopolistic tendencies, the cost of food is being driven up by the gouging behaviour of the supermarkets. And the final thing I would say is the cost of living is not only a state responsibility, it's a household responsibility. And we need to remind people that when we're going through straightened circumstances, you can't always look to Wellington to solve the problems. We've got a mentality in New Zealand, sadly, where we look too often to government to solve the problems, take responsibility, solve them ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Grant, 60 seconds, cost of living crisis, what are we going to do? We've got a situation in New Zealand now where people are struggling to put groceries on the table, food on the table for their families, where they're struggling to pay the rent, where they're struggling to pay the mortgage. I mean, this is where we've got to when you have a government that, can, that overspends recklessly around the country, drives up the price, drives up the um, inflation, which means the Reserve Bank has to put up interest rates. So you need a government that understands what being responsible spending means. You need a government that actually understands that people, the best people to spend their money are the people that earn it, the taxpayers of New Zealand. 
And, and we, the National Party, have got policies to deal with that. We've got tax cuts that are on the table, well funded, that are going to actually deliver for the average household, if a household earning $120,000 a year, 250 bucks a fortnight into their back pockets. That's what responsible government looks like. And the reason we wound up in this situation is because the New Zealand First Party put this lot in Labour and power, and it's their fault. Thank you. Rillo, Jean, what are we going to do about the cost of living crisis? Again? Yeah. We have a targeted cost of living package that we have announced, starting with wanting to roll out universal dental care, first and foremost to our under 30-year-olds. It is a significant cost and a significant barrier. It is something that we have committed to doing if re-elected. We want to take GST off fresh fruit and veggies and frozen veggies. That is something that Northlanders have been asking for since the time of Hone Harawira, actually. <laughs> we are taking right. away the cost sure. of the co-payment of prescriptions and over 3 million prescriptions have been picked up as a result of that policy alone, saving people's health, but also the costs on the health system. We have targeted support for families um, extending uh, early childhood education um, fees to support those families. It is significant. We are also um, looking to... Um, looking to... No, no, sorry. Um, so those... Combined, those cost of living measures combined will make a meaningful difference to those families that need it to get them through this cost of living crisis. And as we saw today with Prefu, we are looking optimistic in terms of the economic horizon, but it will still be tough for a period of time and we will get New Zealanders through it. Mark Cameron, 60 seconds, cost of living crisis, what are we going to do? Thanks very much. Um, Take the bureaucracy in Wellington back to 217 levels. Be rid of the 14,000 extra bureaucrats in there. Ask yourself, are you getting genuine cost-benefit analysis? And in so many ministries, I would argue not. Give the private sector a tax break. I mean, gracious me, those are earning between forty-five dollars and $70,000. We've got a fully alternative costed budget that would afford those good people about $2,300 per each a year. That makes a big dent in the cost of living crisis. And the overall thing I think we've all got to acknowledge, we've got a government that has, expend, has spent exorbitant <coughs> amount of money on things like light rail, $50 million on a sky bridge for the harbour bridge that never got fully costed, was never going to be built. We've got to get back to sensible lawmaking where cost-benefit analysis, do the costs, outweigh the benefits. If so, we're not doing it. Thank you, candidates. We must now wrap with Hold our on. final Sorry. word on the direction of New Zealand. In the polling, 74% of Northland voters believe the country is moving in the wrong direction. We have 25,000 people on the social housing wait list. We spend a million dollars a day keeping beneficiaries in motels. We have massive truancy problems in our schools. 12% of children in New Zealand live in low-income families. 55% of Kiwis are struggling financially. Home ownership is at its lowest level in 70 years. We are facing the worst inflation, food inflation in 30 years, and 100,000 Kiwis are facing homelessness. Candidates, you each have 60 seconds to answer where you think the country is going and how voting for you and your party will impact the direction. From the ACT Party, Mark Cameron, your time starts now. Thanks very much. A couple of things. Let's be rid of co-governance and celebrate that we are all New Zealanders, that we are all Kiwis. Get rid of the, get rid of the nonsense and, the, and, the, and all the theorem of spending in Wellington. We've seen it, and I reiterate the point actually get cost-benefit analysis that actually helps New Zealand. Get the government out of people's lives. And, and I think you would all agree, actually allow us as New Zealanders to do stuff. We're really, really good as New Zealanders. We're really productive, and I maintain there's far too much red type and regulation in the lives of New Zealanders. Thank you, Mark. From Democracy New Zealand, Matt King, your time starts now. So, uh, we've, yeah, I, I, I'd have to say that we've got the worst government that this country has ever had. Yep. 
um, hands down. And I think that this is the most important election that we've got coming up now to get them out. And the best way we can do it is let Kiwis do what Kiwis do. Get out of their way. Health and safety reform, Re Resource Management Act reform, every bit of legislation that gets brought through the parliament, get rid of two others, burn two others. Also consult with the, ta with the voters. Consult with them before you do anything. Seek a mandate before you do anything. Don't sneak into parliament and then by stealth bring in co-governance or five waters or all this other crazy legislation. We are being divided racially, vaccinated, unvaccinated, poor, rich, so much in this country, and the average Kiwi does not want it. We want to become, come back together as Kiwis United. And um, so for me, this election, I think, will be the, the most important election of this um, century, in my view. Thank you, Matt from New Zealand first. Shane Jones, your time starts now. We are in the midst of an anti-growth ideology in New Zealand. The money we seek, the money we require to fund the state can only come from growing the economy. Every single obstacle that exists, and it goes back to Nick Smith and the other geniuses of that era, changing the Resource Management Act, bringing all the Māori hapus into the Resource Management Act. Thank you, Nick Smith. Don't blame Jacinda for that. It was Nick Smith who did that. Those are hobbling economic development. Without economic growth and upward trajectory, you will not deal with the disparities in society. Stop the climate alarmism. Celebrate the qualities that made us Kiwis who we are, innovative, imaginative, tenacious, resilient, and get rid of the woke bullshit. Thank you, Shane. From the National Party, Grant McCallum, your time starts now. Well, the way to get New Zealand back on track is to elect a government that actually understands what it takes to fix an economy. National's track record is strong. The number of times we've had to come in, in 1990, after disastrous Labor government, again in 2008, after a disastrous Labor government, when the GFC hit, we've had to come in and clean up the mess, the overspending, and turn, get the country back on track and, and give people hope. Give and reward people for ambition and working hard. That is not what is happening now. The people are losing hope. So it's na under national, we'll have a strong economic management. We've got the plan to deliver tax cuts to people so they can actually then afford to put, to put food on the table. Only national has a plan to do that, and we have a track record to prove it. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. <clears throat> From the Labour Party candidates, Willow Jean Prime, your time starts now. Since we came into government <clears throat> and we inherited a housing crisis, the Labour government has built more than 13,000 uh, houses and we are on track to deliver 18,000 by 2024. You cannot ignore that. You cannot simply sell off state houses and then, you know, Blame us for emergency housing bills of a million dollars as you were describing. As I mentioned earlier, we have invested in the health infrastructure in Northland. Great to have a plan, didn't have it funded. We have funded it. It's been built all around you. We also have invested in our schools, in our in new classrooms, in our tamariki through programs, like I said, lunches in schools. We have a cost of living plan to get us through this tough economic time, and I acknowledge that it is tough for families out there. But you need to take an honest look at yourselves. You need to look at that plan, see how it's going to be funded, see what is going to be cut. There is a lot at stake in this election, and I implore you all to ask the questions and do your research. Thank you. Comrades, that's the show. Thank you for tuning in to the most important of civic duties, which is the vote. As I stated at the beginning, in an age of disinformation, misinformation and apathy, our democracy needs engaged citizens like never before. Our thanks to the candidates, Gravity Credit Management, The Daily Blog, The Working Group, The Taxpayers Union, Courier Polling, Slipstream Media and Juice TV Freeview 200 for bringing this evening's debate to the live stream masses. We will see you Tuesday next week at the later time of 8.30pm for our unique 
post leaders debate analysis live streamed from the legendary backbenchers bar in Wellington with leaders who weren't invited and pundits to give the first Hipkins versus Luxon TV debate analysis. From the palatial Homestead Sports Bar in Kerry Kerry and the mighty Northland, Kia ora and Kapai New Zealand, you say classy Aotearoa. Good night. <laughs> for Willow Jean. I think, I think this has been, this has been, this has been a really tough crowd for Willow Jean and you fronted up, right, as opposed to the Green Party candidate who didn't, Willow Jean fronted. So I think a round of applause for Willow Jean. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the greatest NZ live political podcast in the world, The Working Group, hosted by beloved left-wing broadcaster Comrade Bomber Bradbury, with the best political panel in New Zealand media, reviewing the week, setting the agenda, avoiding defamation. The Working Group is brought to you by Gravity Credit Management. When the weight of capitalism is becoming the event horizon of an imploding black hole, call 0800 Gravity and our team will get blood out of a stone. That's 0800 Gravity. This is The Working Group.